We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming to our workshop. We are very grateful to IGF for this opportunity to discuss the issue of the Internet citizenship. Also, I would like to thank the panelists for accepting our invitation and nic.br and cdi.br for supporting us in our research. My name is Eduardo Barazal Morales, and I am the coordinator of the Autonomous System Training Area at nic.br in Brazil. Together with my colleague, Tiago Jun Nakamura, from the same training area, we will be the moderators for this workshop. And we are here today to debate the importance of being earnest, a good internet citizen. This round the table is related to the thematic track of universal access and meaningful connectivity. So let me introduce our three panelists. First, we will have two representatives from the technical community, Mr. Albului from Africa, then Mr. Moreiras from South America. Next, we will have a panelist representing the North American civil society's view, Ms. Rosa. So this is how we have planned this workshop. I will start with an introduction to the subject. Then we will have a three question quiz to introduce the discussion of each policy question. After that, we will have an open microphone part in which the panelists will answer questions from the audience. Lastly, we will end up with a conclusion part. So let's start our introduction. The internet is constantly growing and every day new users are joining the network. The pandemic itself helped to accelerate this growth as the internet became essential for people to deal with the pressure of social isolation. Currently, the world population is close to 8 billion people and almost 60% already have internet access. This is a significant percent of users that only tends to increase. However, what is needed to reach the remaining 40%? Do they all know how to use the internet? Is providing internet access the only thing necessary? Can digital citizenship education help these people to join the network? These are the questions we want to discuss with our panelists and the audience. So now let's start our quiz and our debate. Now I kindly ask you all to type in your browser slide.do and enter the code internet citizen all in uppercase. You will have up to two minutes to answer each question, and then the panelists will have up to four minutes each to debate the results and present their points of view. So, Thiago, can you start the quiz, please? Sure. So, uh, just reminding, we have uh, to join the quiz at slido, slido.do or slido.com and type internet citizen as the code. And the first question that we are asking in the context of your country or region, should internet citizenship be taught to people in general? Okay, so you can continue to answer the question. And while uh, the viewers are answering, we will ask for the panelists to speak about uh, each question. 
So each participant will have up to four minutes to speak. So we will start with Mr. Awobului, please. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Fantastic, good. So, uh, so what do I think about this in the context of the country? Uh, should internet citizenship be taught to people in general? Yes, I believe it should be taught to everybody because uh, in this context, some people are not even aware, like in the African context, some people are never aware that they are stakeholders in uh, driving internet citizenship in the region. So let's give, for example, we have in this, in this region, we have over 2,000 languages uh, and content has to be served, you know, for make meaningful impact, you know, for users of the internet, content has to be served in the, lo I mean, in the localized form. And usually we do employ, you know, volunteers free of charge to do things like this. Now, without the educating citizens about this, they might not be aware that they are stakeholders because people all see the government the regulators or the upper, uh, the other bigger bodies within the society as maybe the stakeholders in this kind of thing. So yes, I do agree that uh, I do think we should uh, educate uh, you know, both newcomers and existing uh, citizens about this. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, Mr. Moreiras, do you have anything to add? Yes. Well, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude for the opportunity to be here today debating with all of you about internet governance and the internet development. The IGF really is an amazing mood stakeholder space and I hope it can continue to play the important role it has for a long time to come. Let's get to the question, should the internet citizenship to be taught to people in general? As the majority uh, of the people in the room, my short answer is also yes, sure. Uh, to, better understand, to, uh, to better understand this question, first of all, we should ask ourselves and try to understand what is internet citizenship. When we talk about citizenship on the internet, I believe that we must first consider the meaning of digital citizenship, an expression that is much more recent than the use of the word citizenship alone and with a much more specific meaning. Digital citizenship is usually understood as the responsible use of technology by people. Uh, within the concept, it is considered everyone's right and duty to know how to correctly use technological innovations. And who are the citizens on the internet? Citizen, uh, in the colloquial sense, can refer to any individual, any person. Citizen can also be understood as a synonym for inhabitant. The Internet is not a country or geographic region to have inhabitants, really, but in a figurative sense, we can consider its users the inhabitants of, of the network. Uh, not everyone today has internet access, but we want them to. It's important they do have access and we work for it. But having access is not enough. Uh, in order to use the internet uh, responsible, uh, fully, using it to its full potential, its users, the, the citizens of the internet, need to go far beyond simple access. I think this involves the need for users to know it in depth. Uh, how, how, how does the internet really work? How to behave in different digital environments? What are our responsibilities and rights on the internet? How can they, they, uh, they preserve, they 
privacy online, privacy online. How to use the internet safely? How to buy and sell on the internet? And other, other questions. So, should internet citizenship be taught to people in general? Yes. And we are trying to do it in a number of ways. And later, I, I will talk more about it. For now, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Morias. Now, Mr. Rosa, do you have anything to comment? Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, nice to meet you. Hola, Tunde. Uh, nice to see Antonio again. Uh, it is again, Eduardo uh, and Tiago. Um, so I, I'm very happy to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Nikki BR. And I also add to what Moreira said, how important it is for us to have multi-stakeholder places. So I am from a university. I'm a professor at Virginia Tech. And I feel really excited when I am with the technical community uh, because my research depends a lot on them. Uh, I interview them, I talk to them, I learn with them. So thank you so much for this. Uh, and thank you also for who is there uh, in the audience. I don't know, in Poland or everywhere on the internet. My short question is, I agree with the answers uh, to this question and mainly because when we think about uh, citizenship, uh, we always think in terms of political, civil, and uh, social rights. And education is a social right. Uh, it became a social right in the beginning of the 20th century because uh, the society decided that mm, for us to have adults that can work, for us to have adults that can handle society, we need them to be educated to a certain extent. Uh, so in the beginning, it, education was considered self-improvement. So everyone should try to educate themselves. But when the state noticed the importance of having adults that were educated, that were the moment when education became a social right. And then the state became the provider of that education in, in most countries. So when we talk about the digital world, we should also think about that. And I would extend what uh, uh, Olatun and Moreira said, uh, talking about digital literacy then. Because if we focus digit, uh, internet citizenship, it's a whole thing. So if you focus in one right, in one social right, this social right would be education. And in the digital world, we talk about digital literacy. I would then uh, focus uh, a lot on that because digital literacy is not only accessing we are in a pandemic we know how complicated it is when people are having fake news on their cell phones and they are believing more on fake news than what their children who go to the university who study health are talking about vaccines for example um, and this is an issue uh, it's an issue that is harmful right when you are uh, more uh, prone to believe on fake news than on uh, sources that bring you uh, perspectives that are sourced that come from sources that you can trust so uh, digital literacy comes to tell us that uh, literacy is not only about access it's also about uh, your way of dealing with information, your way of sorting information. Uh, but we have been discussing this for a long time in education. And we are not still in a, in a place where you can say, okay, so what should we teach them? If we agree that this is an important thing, what should we teach? This is not something that we have uh, uh, complete agreement on that. I think that any country, any, any community, any indigenous uh, territory will decide about that. Uh, from the perspective of the, the Americas, I'd say studies that we did in Brazil since uh, the beginning of the 2010, uh, 
we started talking about um, the importance of looking at information, sorting information. But now, because of the work I do with community uh, networks, with people who are building their community networks, I would say that infrastructure is also an important part for us to uh, include in the digital literacy. So I think I talked my four minutes. Uh, we can continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rosa. Uh, so now we can proceed to the next question. Oh, question number two. Uh, what are the key elements that constitute internet citizenship and meaningful internet access? So this is a more complex question. So we will have up to two minutes for the audience to answer. Okay, so now we will ask for the speakers to comment about the question. So we will start with Mr. Moreas, please. Okay. A moment, please. Okay. Uh, let's see. Education, infrastructure, accessibility. Well, I, I will give my opinion. Uh, in my opinion, the, the key elements are infrastructure, education, and people empowerment. And I, I will try to explain it. First, uh, infrastructure. Uh, first and foremost, to exist a, a significant use of the internet, there must be internet access. This access must be an internet access. And no, I'm not just lost in the words and repeating myself here. I just want to emphasize that access must be to the internet, to all of the internet, the complete internet, not to a wallet garden with a half a dozen apps, uh, either because of commercial restriction, such as uh, uh, access to certain app packages only or restriction made by governments with bans and block or even technical restrictions such as those uh, automatically imposed imposed in practice by, by connections to connections of low capacity People should have access to the internet, to the entire internet, to all of the internet. It starts there. Uh, we can we can go even even uh, a little further on this issue. We must be concerned con concerned about the quality of the local internet infrastructure. Is infrastructure? How are the quality parameters of assessing the main services and content uh, used in the region? Latense, Pactelos, is there local peering between different ISPs? Are there CDNs installed installed uh, in the in the local infrastructure? How is the knowledge of the internet users users about the infrastructure? Do they know the difference between fiber optics, cable, radio, 4G, 5G access? 
uh, do they know how to install a Wi-Fi router and a repeater in their home? So these are questions about infrastructure and it's important to have good infrastructure and people, it's important that people, that internet users know about infrastructure. And about the education. Education, uh, in, the same, in the sense of providing training for the use of the internet to, to its users, is in my opinion, one of the most important points. Um, I work at nick.br and one of the things my team do, does in, is technical training. Uh, we are used to teach uh, the technical internet community, but this uh, this need to to capacity the networks users in general, so that they can use the internet better, more responsibly, more fully, has become more evident to use to us over time, uh, and. For some time, we thought, how could we collaborate? And about a year ago, we created an initiative that we call uh, Cidadão na Rede, in Portuguese. Uh, Internet Citizen, in English. Ciudadano en la Red, in Spanish. We, we decided to do this capacity through short videos. Uh, animations of about 15 seconds with no narration, uh, animations that focus on just one point, uh, a simple tip, a concept. They can be downloaded, they can be shared on social media and messaging apps. They are short enough to be displayed uh, to be displayed in the commerce, in elevators, in public transportation system. And they cover different topics, and such as how internet works, internet security, internet rights and duties, and internet behavior. And I'd like to show you two uh, small examples. It's only 30 seconds. Uh, Thiago, if you can stop sharing the stream, I, I think uh, Zoom will pin my. Uh, I, I will show the video here in my webcam. So if you stop to share the screen, uh, the, 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 your, your screen, sure, I think sure. my, my webcam is pinned to the, to the screen of the puppy. Yes. Um, and this is the first video. There is no audio. 15 seconds. This is the second video. Are you able to see it? If not, I can... Uh, Eduardo is telling in the chat that uh, you are not able to see. I will try to share the screen another way and to show it again, then uh, please uh, wait a second. Um, Thiago, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think I'm sharing the screen. Maybe you can see now, this is the website. This is the second video. Wow. 
so uh, the videos are available at internet citizen dot nic n i c dot b r uh, and we have versions in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And this is a contribution we are trying to do in this education area. And um, the third point, people empowerment. Uh, with access to the internet and education, people will be empowered. Empowered to use the internet fully empowered to be better versions of themselves and to build a better version of the world. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution, Mr. Moreiras. Now we will uh, ask Ms. Rosa, do you have anything to add? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much for sharing these resources. I I heard of it yet about it yesterday, and I think it may be a a real contribution, including for schools. Like it's a very easy uh, resource to share in classroom. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I like the 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 results of this quiz here. Uh, Eleven people answered. Uh, well, education, it was what we were talking before. So we were talking about literacy, and I think that uh, this is one of the, the most important aspects of it, what uh, we need to have for us to have uh, good access. Uh, I was trying to, I, I started to say that uh, about how today knowledge about infrastructure is also uh, important in the in the area of uh, literacy in the digital world, because uh, Moreira has brought a very important aspect of infra infrastructure. Uh, where is it located? If it, if CDNs uh, are located in certain countries, in your data. Uh, is going to that country for it for us to have access to such data. So when our data leaves uh, the national borders uh, where we are located and goes to other spaces to other countries, then the laws of that country will be uh, the laws valid uh, looking at that data. So depending on the laws about privacy in that country, depending on uh, how they uh, manage international traffic, you may be surveilled, for example, without knowing. Uh, I bring this idea because I know, for example, that from Africa, most of the data needs to go internationally for it to come back. So we have lots of trombone when you have uh, data going and coming back, even if it could stay there. And when this happens, and uh, commonly Europe is the place where data from Africa is going, uh, laws of that countries in Europe will be uh, governing that data. Uh, in Brazil, we have uh, a different dynamic, but it's still, uh, we also have situations where we have international traffic. And uh, many people are, who do not have access, this is for the people who have access, right? For the people who do not have access yet, they are building their own infrastructure to have access to the internet as a way to, to be a citizen in this uh, digital space. But when they are doing that, uh, there, there are many constraints because of uh, the market, because of the players who are in the market. So we also need to uh, be aware of what is necessary for this infrastructure to be available for, again, indigenous people, for, again, people in the peripheries of the big cities where we don't have that much infrastructure. Uh, I think this is an extremely important, extremely important element for us to talk. And regarding the, the now the accessibility aspect, I love that that came to one of the top answers because this brings us to the idea of equality and diversity uh, on the internet. Uh, how it is important for us to have a space where everyone can feel welcome and invited. If uh, women are, is, are not feeling invited because of cyber bullying, uh, if black people are feeling uh, 
harmed because of the ways that people talk about us. Uh, we should be concerned about that, and it should be. And then we should have regulations in, to a certain extent to uh, avoid this kind of situations. Um, it's very hard how we are uh, we are dealing with this now because uh, we tried for many years uh, to have a, a non-regulated space on the internet. Uh, and what is going on now is that we are seeing more and more that uh, sometimes the harm is greater than uh, the simply uh, than the opportunity to have seen a, a space with no regulation. So we are now discussing if the laws we created a decade ago are still valid, for example, right? And uh, when I'm talking about laws, I'm uh, talking about the Brazilian space. Uh, in the US, for example, this is, uh, this is less common because uh, the, the dynamics in the US is to have a more uh, liberal space on the internet. But it's still, uh, we, are, we are in face of a big challenge now, uh, especially because of the fake news. We have a damage, including for democracies. So uh, even countries that are very liberal uh, as the US, we start to discuss the moderation of content on platforms. And this is, I think, related with this idea also of accessibility, because if we are discussing uh, moderation of content because of elections, we should also be considering what are what is our role when people are being harmed because of content circulated. So I will stop here. Yeah, very insightful. Thank you very much for your contribution, Ms. Rosa. Now uh, I will ask Mr. Awobulu, Abu, Awobului, please, if you have something to comment. Hello again, everyone. I kind of <clears throat> rushed the first time. I didn't introduce myself properly. So I'm Olatunde Awobului. Uh, I'm an instructional designer and trainer with uh, Afrinic, which is the African Network Information Center. And uh, I will uh, always, I mean, I will give my answers in the African perspective, because this is where I actually operate most of the time. And uh, hi again, Eduardo and Thiago. <laughs> nice to meet you guys. So um, I do, okay, in the African perspective, infrastructure definitely comes up on the top of the list of also. So, uh, you know, reports, there are reports that say we have about, <clears throat> excuse me, but 45% of Africans are like over 10 kilometers away from fiber access. You know, even though there are high penetration, uh, the penetration rates in the continent is improving. Uh, infrastructure is still a is still a is still an issue. So, and like and uh, like uh, Antonio rightfully said, without infrastructure, there is no access. Now, accessibility in the African context <laughs> or perspective again, I will define it as affordable and localized content without any geo restrictions. So yes, there is internet penetration rates, but it is, I mean, in Africa, it is expensive compared to other parts of the world. Um, so, and I would like to throw a spanner into this squeeze again in the responses here by putting in government policies. Now that would be the third one. That would be the third one for me. Now we, we want to have government policies where that encourages or, or, no, or no, reduces the bottlenecks or the regulatory practices that encourage competition among operators within the local markets, between the local markets. Because one of the reasons why we, the, 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 the cost is up is because we don't have real competition here in this part of the world. So government policies are also coming very, very key here in the African perspective. And with that, we can drive accessibility by making internet access affordable like I said, localized because we have a huge amount of languages here and users will want to be served, you know, content in, the, in what they understand in their local con context. And then geo restrictions. So uh, we don't want to have, because I don't want to mention any apps here or any uh, uh, services where in other parts of the world, the features you have are different compared to the ones you have in this part of the, this side of the world. And it's the same service. Okay, and 
Um, some of these uh, services I'm talking about can you know, drive, could boost the digital economy in this part of the world, but because of lack of these features, we don't have that. So that's why I define accessibility as affordable, localized content without any geo restrictions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Obuli. Now we will go to the last question. So uh, question number three. Should internet security and safety practice be considered part of meaningful access and good citizenship on the internet? So we will have one minute for the audience to answer, then we will ask for the speakers. Okay, so now we will start with Ms. Rosa, if you have something to comment. Yeah, sure. Uh, interesting that we have a divided <laughs> result, right? And I, I like that, and I'm thinking of how I will address the, the, the response, because when we say if this, could be, this should be uh, considered part of a good citizenship, security and safety, uh, my answer uh, was yes. But then seeing the results, I'm also thinking of another element and I will share with you one thing, uh, which is uh, in this moment of internet of things, who are the citizens of this digital world? Uh, because in the beginning, we thought always about humans, right? But the more and more we have machines being connected, uh, are machines also going to be considered uh, citizens in this space? I ask this question because other people have already discussed that, uh, including in Brazil, we have uh, Yazodara Cordova and Virgilio Almeida, people who you uh, might know. They've uh, asked the question about robots. Who should have the right to be autonomous on the internet? And, and that's important because if we have so many robots on Twitter, if we have so many robots around and they are, uh, they are uh, anonymous, if I said autonomous, I would like to say anonymous, not autonomous. Uh, if they are anonymous on the internet, uh, what is the harm that they are bringing to us? So we should really distinguish humans from robots on the internet, we should be able to have this distinction to know that when someone is just uh, bringing that information to us uh, on our timeline and say, oh, okay, this is a robot, right? And someone is behind the robot. That's another point. Um, but I'm talking about that because when I think of safety and security, I'm thinking about encryption and I'm thinking about an anonymity. I think that anonymity uh, is very important on the internet. It's also a, a way for us to uh, be safe sometimes. Uh, but more and more, because of the, the way we, our internet evolved, we, are, we don't have, in many situations, this right anymore because we have a way to track many, many different data, uh, many kinds of data uh, of who are using. Um, so just call attention to the idea of anonymity as an important element that we should always come back because anonymity is also important in many situations. And in terms of um, machines, uh, we should not regard to them this right of anonymity at all. And we should be always able to distinguish, uh, to distinguish that. Uh, 
Okay, thank you very much for your contribution, Ms. Rosa. Now, uh, Mr. Albuli, do you have anything to add? Yes. Um, so uh, I saw, uh, I think that was a very good video that uh, Antonio shared about uh, in a very short clip, educating uh, users or to internet citizens to be on how to use the internet or to be more aware. So uh, in the African perspective also, it would be a resounding yes, that uh, this is very important, not only for the younger ones, but even the uninformed or digital illiterate older adults, uh, this is very important. I uh, also pull in the, you know, uh, maybe stakeholders like government to, uh, to maybe uh, develop a more, to legalize to, uh, the legislation, develop legislation that addresses issues like maybe like probably some regions, what is online harassment? What does that mean? Uh, uh, fraud might be more uh, uh, recognized, but there's some other, other issues on you know, that you might come across on the internet that there's no legislative uh, uh, structure in place that addresses uh, uh, this in this region. So I will look at that also, but yes, it's a resounding yes that we need to uh, inf educate everyone about the safety and practices and using the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Obului. Now, Mr. Moreiras, do you have any comments? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about uh, about the response. Uh, yes, but only in specific cases. I'd like to to hear people that answer this way uh, after our comments, if possible. And yeah, I, I will give my answer. My answer is yes, it should be included. Um, I, I think security, safety, privacy, all these concepts are interrelated and add up to each other. Uh, people share personal information openly without thinking about the risks that uh, exposure brings. Companies and other institutions collect, process, store, share people's personal information without doing care increasing risk, all kinds of risk, including safety-related risks. I think the control of the personal data must be in the hands of the users, of the owners by right of this kind of information. And they must understand the implications of sharing this data and give it the others the right to know it and sometimes even to control it. And uh, I ask, who really knows the implications of this today? I think we are all learning. And about security, most users don't know how to properly create and manage passwords, don't know what, what, it, what it is and how to use double factor authentication. Uh, most of the users cannot distinguish from an uh, official source for installing applications from a suspicious source. They don't know the importance of a backup or how, how to do a backup. They don't know the importance of keeping, keeping systems up to date. Uh, part of the solution to internet security problems even the most complex internet security problems involves, involves education, training of the end users, of the users uh, that, know, that don't know technology. And I think it's also up to our and us, uh, also up to each one of the stakeholders to make the life easier easier uh, for users when it comes to security. Protocols have to be secured by default. Softwares should update automatically. We should make authentication and encryption methods easier to use with, with sim simpler, simpler interfaces. 
we must uh, handle personal data uh, more carefully. I think everyone can look at the services the, they provide on the internet and see how they can collaborate better. Well, and I, I would like to finish uh, this contribution by showing you some more two short animations of Internet Seats and .br, this time on issues related to security. Uh, when I showed the, the other videos, I was with a blur here in, in Zoom uh, activated. So after that, uh, I understood what happened. I, I'll try again. Let's see if you can see the videos this time. So don't repeat your passwords. And take care uh, when you when you are installing new apps. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moreiras. So now uh, we will start the open microphone session. So if any of the audience wants to comment or to ask any questions to the speakers, please feel free to speak. While we wait for the questions, uh, if uh, the speakers want to make any final comments to the presentation, uh, we can start with Ms. Rosa. If you have any final comments, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm very excited again. Uh, I learned a lot with your comments. I also like the different perspectives that uh, came up uh, because of the different panelists. Um, I am glad we, I was here. Uh, and I hope we can continue this conversation. Again, uh, we should not dismiss information and all the studies that have been done already, um, especially uh, because uh, Nick is starting and is putting this together. I am very excited with the production of the videos. I would also say that it would be amazing to have the education community uh, to a certain extent connected to it. I said that uh, they may use these videos, but I think that uh, many people from the ed education community can also help to build uh, certain uh, contents. And I'm saying that because um, in 2015, uh, I wrote a book, I co-authored a book, uh, and it was about mobile learning. And one thing that we were discussing a lot uh, in that context was at that moment, mobile learning was something is still not that present as it is now because of the pandemic. But one thing that we were discussing there is, okay, so if we need to teach about technologies, if we need to teach about the internet, how do we uh, bring that to the curriculum of our schools, right? Because if we think that this will be necessary for the future, we should have this kind of uh, content in our schools. So you probably have heard of all these movements about coding and teaching coding. Uh, but we were also thinking about what should we bring to the to the classroom when we are talking about history, when we are talking about geography. So can we in a history class also understand the history of computing and cybernetics? 
And why we have now these problems? Because the, in the origin of cybernetics, we can also understand why we are in this trouble now, because the decisions that were made in the beginning of what we have today also contributes for us to understand where we are. In terms of geography, as uh, just Moreira and Olatun said, okay, can we include in geography uh, classes things about where CDNs are? Uh, how our data flow on the information? This is also geography, right? So uh, this, uh, we were thinking about that in 2015. Many people were thinking of that in the education area. So I'll just uh, call attention to the importance of connecting these uh, elements, like the knowledge we have in the technical community with the knowledge we have in the education community. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Rosa. Uh, Ms. Aobului, do you have any final comments? <laughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, please, I would like to have the, uh, the link for those videos again. I think they're very wonderful. Uh, I did, uh, it was a, I liked, I really enjoyed the session, uh, the, the different perspectives that the different uh, panelists uh, brought to the table. Uh, it was interesting to, to uh, you know, digest this. And then just like Antonio said also, I, I'm quite interested in knowing some of the people who voted uh, only in some cases, why uh, people should uh, be educated about uh, internet citizenship. I'm quite interested in that. Uh, it would be nice to, to hear their opinions. But other than that, it's been a, a very wonderful and informative session for me too. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Moreiras, do you have any final comments? I'd like just to thank you all for coming to this session. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, you to, to know this initiative of Nick.br that is called Internet Citizen, internetcitizen.nick.br. And uh, it's very interesting the perspective that Fernanda bring us because uh, me and uh, Olaton, uh, we are from the technical community, and Fernanda bring us the uh, uh, kind of different views, different perspectives, and uh, I think it's very interesting to uh, this um, uh, the suggestions of uh, of uh, getting the, the the view of education community, and uh, we all could work more together and that's a good thing uh, i'd like to to have uh, more inputs for this project uh, of nick.br uh, from other areas uh, other other stakeholders um, and that's it thank you thank you all thank you mr morias uh, if any of the audience has any questions that you want to comment, uh, we still have some time. I have a hypothesis about that result and then result. I think that some of the people who answered were robots. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, so uh, we thank you all for participating in our workshop. Uh, I think some of the points that uh, were spoken here, uh, first of all, uh, this is the, a discussion. So uh, I found it very interesting that uh, some of the speakers actually disagreed on the answers that we had uh, on the screen, because that's why what is all about. Uh, we need to discuss things, not, not because everybody wants something that necessarily it's right, or it's not about right or wrong. It's about discussing how can we uh, make internet a better place. And internet, it's a tool at heart. So uh, we need to understand that uh, it needs to serve us for a better life. So uh, there are many people there are still out there that don't, don't have internet access. And sometimes just having the connectivity is not enough. We need to have a meaningful connectivity for those people. This is very complex and we need to further develop this topic because 
this is just a start for the conversation. So uh, I think it was very insightful. I would like to thank you all the speakers for the very uh, thoroughly comments and very specific cases for each region. Uh, I would like to thank you all the audience for the participating in this workshop. I think it was very great to have you all here. And please don't let this topic die. We need to further uh, study these uh, issues because it's very important for those people that uh, still don't have internet access. So we'd like to thank you all oh, <laughs> for this. Uh, for your participation and hopefully we see you next year at IGF. Thank you all very much. Thank you, obrigada. Thank you, Eduardo, Thiago, Antonio, and Fernanda. <laughs> Bye, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.